Legal systems differ around the world. Each has its own particular way of dealing with offenders. For instance, a Californian court judge has meted out public humiliation as one way of embarrassing fathers who neglect paying child maintenance to their ex-wives. Fathers who end up in this court not only have to pay what they owe, but can be heard on street corners around the city publicly apologising for their negligence. But regardless of the punishment, all courts have one primary objective, justice. Of course, there are many instances where justice does not prevail. On the second night of our stay at Ayers Rock, um, without warning, a dingo entered our tent and took our baby daughter while she was asleep. Uh, she was nine weeks and four days old and took her and uh, killed her. Uh, we have never seen her since. Of course, the situation on the night of losing Azaria just seemed like a horrendous nightmare because here we are flailing out in the dark looking for my daughter who's been attacked and taken by a dingo uh, wondering if you do stumble across her what will she be like and, and, and half praying oh god don't show me we subsequently went to a coroner's inquest where the coroner felt so strongly about it, he was a former detective, that he gave Australia's first televised interview on the finding into a coroner's inquest. He brought down the finding that uh, a dingo indeed had taken Azaria and that uh, we had been um, subject to uh, very uh, vilifying gossip and innuendo and he apologised on behalf of Australia for all the rubbish that had been sent our way. Northern Territory Government also received a serve out of this. Their police were uh, categorically criticised. Their forensic uh, methodology was uh, heavily uh, uh, criticised. And Northern Territory Government appeared to take exception to this. And uh, they reopened the case. In 1981, end of 1981, uh, we were charged this time with a second inquest which allowed no evidence uh, on our behalf to be presented, nothing about the dingo, but the theory was that Azari had been killed in our car. We duly went to trial, we had very good lawyers in 1982 in Darwin, and uh, the worst thing that could have ever happened did, uh, we were convicted by a Northern Territory jury. Uh, we were convicted on the basis as charged. Uh, Lindy was... Uh, sent to jail, uh, but basically with the key thrown away, and uh, I was given a suspended 18-month sentence. A federal, at least a federally um, inspired a Royal Commission was uh, carried out, and in the middle of 1987 and June 2, the Royal Commissioner, uh, Mr Morling, brought down the finding that the case against us was unsafe and unsound, and that Lindy Chamberlain should never have gone to jail, that I should never have been charged either. In 1988, uh, in October 15, we were totally exonerated by a Northern Territory uh, court of, consisting of three Supreme Court judges. And in 1991, we received uh, significant compensation for false convictions. The need for justice is a consequence of the controversy between Jesus and Satan, good and evil. Will Satan be punished for the sin that he alone has cultivated? And what about us? How and when will God judge our lives? The answer is found in the book of Daniel. It tells an amazing prophecy about the Jewish nation that later came true. It also explains how an ancient Jewish tradition is a replica of the justice system of heaven. It's one of the most exciting prophecies in the Bible, and our journey begins in Jerusalem. About the only thing more interesting than the street life in Jerusalem is the unbelievable story of the Jewish people. After 3,500 years of written history, 
they've outlasted many of their contemporaries like the Hittites and Perizzites, who today are history. Yet the Jews have endured many hardships over the years. They've been slaves, had their homeland invaded at least eight times, were exiled for nearly 2,000 years, and millions were exterminated by the Nazis. And yet the Jews not only survive, but they've taken back their ancient land rights right next door to over 100 million Arab Muslims who despise them. The story of the Jewish people is amazing and apparently unpredictable, except someone predicted it 2,500 years ago. Jerusalem's Wailing Wall is one of the most sacred sites in Judaism, but it's really only a retaining wall from the garden of the gorgeous temple that used to stand up here just behind me. At that time, it was one of the wonders of the world. Where the temple stood, there is now the third most holy place for Muslims, the Dome of the Rock. The Jewish temple was destroyed in the year AD 70, just after the time of Christ. Amazingly, this was predicted with stunning accuracy by the prophet Daniel, some 600 years before it happened. His book contains what Jews call the cursed chapter, and it was in it that Daniel made his most startling prediction. The prophecy outlined in Daniel 8 and 9 is one of the most fascinating in the Bible. It spans many centuries and it contains some amazing predictions that are still impacting on us today. As a young Jewish prince, Daniel was captured in Jerusalem and taken as a prisoner to Babylon around 600 BC. As the years of captivity passed, the aging prophet Daniel was upset and discouraged by the fact that his people, the Jews, were still slaves in Babylon almost 70 years later. Meanwhile, his home city and the temple of the God he loved was also in ruins. Well, we read that he took his doubts about the future to God. And like a bolt out of the blue in the midst of an important message from God, the angel Gabriel says to Daniel, Because of rebellion, the host of the saints and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It prospered in everything it did, and truth was thrown to the ground. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to him, How long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled? Feeling confused? Well, so was Daniel. As he listened to a discussion between two of the heavenly beings, he understood that apparently truth and the sanctuary were both going to come in for a bad time. That is, trodden underfoot. Now, when something is trodden underfoot, it is usually destroyed. Daniel listened as one of the heavenly beings explained how long the sanctuary and truth would be oppressed. He said to me, it will take 2,300 evenings and mornings. Then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. So, for a period of 2,300 days, truth and the sanctuary would face difficult times. And I guess I still ask the question, why? Has this happened to me, Lord? But then Daniel asked the same question. How long, O Lord? And many of God's people have asked those questions, as indeed Jesus did on the cross. Why have you forsaken me? Now, what is this sanctuary referred to in Daniel? The Bible speaks of two sanctuaries. One was the earthly sanctuary built by Moses after the pattern of the other sanctuary in heaven, the one where God's throne is. The earthly sanctuary revealed wonderful lessons about how a person is restored to a right relationship with God. My concept of justice is based on a number of elements. It's based on what I learned at my parents' knee. There was a very strong silver thread running through that. In our home there was always justice meted out, justice with mercy. Then there's a Christian element in my life where I know in the Gospels Jesus is very clear on the matter of justice because he very severely criticized the Pharisees for not performing uh, the rites and spirit of justice, mercy and faith. They were the underlying and undergirding principles of the Gospel of, of, 
of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then, of course, the third thing was that I always thought that the Australian court, through a jury system, would, uh, would clearly bring justice down to people who were obviously innocent. Have you ever wondered why the bad guys seem to prosper and the good guys get a rough deal? Why do evil people seem to get away with everything? Where's the justice? Well, this prophecy helps explain why this happens and what God is going to do about it. For a long period of time, the 2,300 days, the devil has been counterfeiting truth and has made error popular. But there's a time coming when this is going to change. Justice will be done and hope will emerge again. In Old Testament times, if a person sinned, they brought along a sacrifice to the priest. That sacrifice was brought to the altar in the sanctuary. In the ritual that took place, blood was central. Various things was done with the blood of the animal to emphasize that uh, it was the blood of the sacrifice, the, the death of the animal, which brought about forgiveness of sin. It was a horrifying act but it was intended to graphically teach the Jews about the terrible consequences of sin. But while sin resulted in death, God provided a way of forgiveness through the sacrificial offering, and every lamb that died pointed forward to Jesus' death. It's a unique model of justice, is it not? You will remember that Daniel 8, 13 and 14 states that truth and the sanctuary will be trodden down until the end of the 2,300 days. But how can 2,300 days take the prophecy down to the time of the end? 2,300 days would only be a little over six years. This wouldn't take the prophecy past Daniel's time, let alone to the time of the end. The uh, day for a year uh, relationship in scripture has its roots in the Exodus movement. When the spies were sent out, uh, they spent 40 days spying the land, they came back with a report. Uh, as we know from scripture, the report was generally unfavorable. There was a minority report in implying we should go right in. But the majority report was accepted by Israel, uh, much to the disappointment of God, who sent them back into the wilderness uh, for 40 years, one year for each day that the spies had been out. Forever afterwards, that became in Scripture a sort of a time gauge that the Lord uses to indicate to us His plans. We find it particularly in the book of Daniel, I believe. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. The Hebrew word determine means cut off, like an amputation. So 70 weeks are cut off or amputated from the 2,300 years for the Jewish people. 70 weeks comprise 490 days or years in prophetic time. The 490 years, unlike the other main prophecies in Daniel, have to do only with the Jewish people and their, their specific uh, spiritual future. So in this prophecy, you have a general prophecy that takes us from some point in Daniel's day to 2,300 years into the future, where a period called the time of the end will begin. The 490 years have to do with the Jews. The second period of 1,810 years takes us further on to the judgment. But what is the starting point for the 2,300 year period? From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. Remember that when Daniel received this prophecy from Gabriel, the Babylonians had conquered Jerusalem and the entire city was in ruins. Most of the defenders had died and a few like Daniel were taken captives as prisoners of war. But God gave his people a ray of hope. Gabriel said to Daniel, here's a sign. Know and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, or in other words, watch for a decree to be issued that will allow you to return to your homeland. Now, if we turn to another part of the, uh, of the Bible, where we find these decrees actually preserved, the books of Ezra and Nehemiah actually preserved the wording of these decrees, 
And we find there that there are, in fact, four. There is more than one. There are four. And the choice or the, or the, the uh, secret to finding the beginning date for this time prophecy is to decide which of those four decrees is the operative one. It's the third of these decrees which was uh, issued to uh, Ezra by King Artaxerxes I, which uh, prompted the rebuilding of the city. You see, up until that time, rebuilding efforts were strictly limited to the temple. And even that was hindered by local uh, peoples who were opposed to the Jews rebuilding. So the work went very slowly, and it only included the temple. It was only when Artaxerxes I issued a decree to uh, Ezra, who was another of the Jewish leaders, uh, in the year 457 BC, that the work on rebuilding the city itself actually begun. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. That's seven weeks and 62 weeks or 69 weeks. Or putting that into years, 483 years. Now, at the end of the 69th week, which would be 483 years from the issuing of the decree, a prince was to be anointed. Uh, an, an anointed person, in Hebrew terminology, is a messiah person. The word messiah comes from the act of, of uh, the anointing ceremony. And uh, who was anointed in 27 AD? In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene. The 15th year of Tiberius was AD 27, and according to verse 21, in that very year, Jesus was baptized. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And the baptism of Jesus is understood as the anointing of a prince. So far in this prophecy, we have noticed that 69 weeks, or 483 years, bring us down to the baptism or anointing of Jesus. But the prophecy said 70 weeks, or 490 years, were set aside for the Jews. In other words, there is one week or seven years left to detail in the prophecy. Gabriel predicted something was going to happen in that last week. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And seven years from 27 AD, we would come to 34. Now, in the midst of the week, we will take as representing halfway point. So we come back from seven years, three and a half years, and we come to the midst of that week or that seven-year block of time. Jesus' public ministry from his baptism until his crucifixion lasted three and a half years. So... His baptism represented the anointing, the fulfillment of the anointing of a prince, as prophesied by Daniel. And the cutting off of this anointed one is a clear reference to the crucifixion of Jesus, which would then be dated at Easter time in AD 31. But there is still more, for we are only in the middle of this week. There are still three and a half years left, which would bring us to AD 34. What happened then? The church grew so rapidly that the apostles had to appoint some assistants. They were called deacons. One of them was named Stephen. And Stephen's main contribution after he was appointed a deacon was to deliver a speech, a very long speech, before the Jewish authorities. Uh, Stephen's speech stirred up this leading council of the Jews to the extent that they determined that they had to silence him. And they silenced him by taking him out of the council room and stoning him. So we see at the end of this 490-year period a clear event which marked the close of the time period during which the Jewish people had a special relationship with God, were known as God's special people. And from that event onward, the people of God became redefined. As we look at this prophecy, we see that every one of these events on the timeline has been fulfilled. Jesus was baptized on time in AD 27. 
Jesus was crucified on time in AD 31, and the gospel went to the Gentiles on time in AD 34. These are all events associated with the first coming of Jesus. Each one is dealing with Jesus, the sacrificial lamb, his resurrection, his being our high priest in the sanctuary. But remember the question posed in the prophecy? How long is the truth and the sanctuary going to be trodden underfoot? He said to me, it will take 2,300 evenings and mornings. Then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. The 490 years were cut off or amputated from the 2,300 years. This would mean we have 1,810 years left. That from AD 34 would bring us down to the year 1844, when the end of time judgment would begin. And in 1844, God and Christ began working together to bring about the, the great cosmic day of atonement in which records were cleared, people were, were forgiven or not forgiven, depending on the choices that they had made. The fact that we're living in the time of the end no doubt helps explain why we continue to be plagued by war and famine, violence and heartache and injustice. Our world is not improving in spite of all our human efforts. It is the time of the end. Jesus is about to return and triumph over the forces of evil. Just how much longer God will let this world continue, we have not been made privy to. But every passing day is surely one step closer to the coming of Jesus. I guess uh, the first thing I will look for on that great day is my daughter, Azaria. And as promised, I know she'll be there. So that is uh, a remarkable hope that I have to look forward to. But the strange thing is that I will not be seeking for any revenge or vengeance upon anybody who's wronged me, I'm sure. That is in the hand and, and the book of God. Um, that's for him to, to decide. The reassuring thing about this prophecy is that the return of Jesus promises final justice. Whereas human justice systems rarely, if ever, deliver totally just outcomes, Daniel's prophecy promises unequivocal justice. Everyone who avails themselves of the justice provided through the death of Jesus will receive forgiveness and eternal life. Well, today's episode was a little more involved than some others were, wasn't it? But the message is very important. You see, to forgive somebody who has wronged you is not easy to do. It takes far more than what we have in our own human natures to be able to do just that. It really requires that each of us have the nature of God. But you might say, how is that possible? Jesus once spoke to a leader of the Jews, Nicodemus, and told him that he must be born again. He needed to have a new nature inside him, so his natural, get even, selfish and rebellious desires could be changed. You can probably remember the last time somebody hurt you. It's not easy to forgive them, is it? When a baby's born, it starts life brand new. This is what God wants to do for you and for me. Give us a new God-like, unselfish, forgiving nature. He further promises that he will give us not only the new nature, but also the strength to be able to live like that. I can tell you that it's impossible without God giving us his strength, for he wants us to be ready for his return to the earth. Remember from our study today that we are all in a cosmic battle where the forces of evil have been able to counterfeit and obscure the truths of God's wonderful character of love and forgiveness. 
Now, in these last days, God wants us to share in the freedom that His strength and power provide. I'd like to give you a little book that has been a real help to me in explaining how to be born again and live the life God wants me to live. If you'd like to receive this book, why not give us a call now? And may God continue to bless you every day. I'm going to look forward to being with you in the next episode.